Well, wow, an at-capacity crowd. We sort of predicted this would happen, but I feel badly for the people who are arriving at time and are told that they're going to have a great chance to hear this lecture on our website, on YouTube, in, a, in about a week, but really pretty exciting. Welcome to a very proud day at the Wichita Art Museum. I'm Patricia McDonald, the director here. It's heartwarming that we're able to gather and that we have such a crowd here at the museum today. We're over 600 people who've come to share the day with us um, in welcoming um, art, American art to go um, here through the spring. So I hope, I hope the whole room already has taken in and seen our new Art Deco exhibition that opens just today. Um, I have always adored Art Deco, this style movement, and I assume many of you do as well. Um, so something that uh, formulated in the 1920s and lasted longer into the 30s, but it's the lo it, it love for it has continued on, and even at this moment, there's um, quite a resurgent of Art Deco. As I get magazines and mail order catalogs, I see, aha, Art Deco, Art Deco reminiscences. At any rate, this is an exhibition that the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City and the Jocelyn Art Museum in Omaha did as a joint collaboration. And the, um, the chief curator, Catherine Footer, at the Nelson Atkins um, was the mastermind behind the exhibition. Catherine has now gone on, and she's the senior curator at the Brooklyn Museum, so she's not joining us this weekend. One of the things that's really great about the exhibition is virtually all the loans come from the Midwest. And as a matter of fact, the Wichita Art Museum has contributed six works of art um, to the show. Um, this is a style moment that reigned during the interwar years. So from the First World War, really until the start of the Second World War. And it evokes the exuberance of that um, era. Uh, it's based on angularity or geometry, and that is to evoke an energy and dynamism, a real, an optimism that existed in that age. So think about the kind of syncopations of jazz as just one touchstone. Um, it, Art Deco abandoned the swirly swoops of Art Deco that preceded it, and also a Victorian ornamentation um, and, and patterning that um, designed before that. Um, um, and it, it, after the First World War, um, it was a moment to reach for levity and laughter. I really appreciate the quote from Gertrude Stein, the, the author, who observed that um, the 20th century only began after the First World War. In the First World War, there were 13 million soldiers who perished. And there were more men died in the First World War than all major Western wars from 1790 to 1914. So that helps us sort of get a foothold on just how brutal an experience um, that moment in history was. So some measure of frivolity and, and you know, leaving the past behind and really reaching for um, a new modernity is part of the phenomenon of Art Deco. This exhibition attracted such incredible generosity. Um, um, it's quite, quite the budget to be able to bring an a nationally touring exhibition at this level to our city. And wonderful businesses and people step forward to help us make that happen. So uh, pa be patient with me as I um, uh, applaud and, and thank uh, these folks. Our presenting sponsor is the Latner Family Foundation. The Judy Slauson Exhibition Fund and the DeVore Foundation were lead sponsors. Then, Emprise Bank, Charles Baker, David and Rinthia Mitchell, Jan and Steve Randall provided other major underwriting. Um, great support also came from the Trust Company of Kansas, John and Nancy Bramer, Donna Bunk, Carol and Guy Glidden, Sandra Langle, Mary Sue Smith, and there are more. Um, Charles Baker and Jim Phillips Exhibition Fund, Sue and Fred Berry, Alan and Sharon Ferry, Tony and Bud Gates, Patty and Jeff Kennedy, 
Harold and Evelyn Gregg, Sonia Gretemann and Chris Bruner, Anita Jones and Richard Haidt, Delmar and Mary Clucky, Errol and Susan Luganbill, Glenn and Marion Misko, Barry and Jane Murphy, Kristen and Will Price, Bob and Nancy Schwan, Sue and Kurt Watson also helped um, with this exhibition. And our standard bearers, not to forget them, the Paula and uh, Barry Downing Foundation support all the exhibitions and public programs that we have each year. And our exhibitions receive support from the Friends of the Wichita Art Museum and the City of Wichita. And I would like some applause in, in part because many of the people whose names I just read are with us in the room at the moment. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I cannot tell you how excited I am and have been um, about the afternoon presentation. Architect Dean Bradley and art photographer Larry Schwarm have had a long relationship with the Wichita Art Museum with many projects um, over many years, and um, not coincident, incoincidentally, they both love Art Deco. Um, th th so they've teamed with us uh, for this presentation, and it has been a huge surprise to me to discover through um, sort of having a behind the scene look at the, what they're presenting today. Art Deco is here and there and everywhere in Wichita. There's so many buildings that I, you know, hurrying on my path, I drove by and had no idea that that was an Art Deco building. And we're all going to learn um, about that today. So Dean is with Pratt Adams Bradley Architecture. He offices in the Garvey Building downtown. His practice is really focused on residential architecture. Um, and I would tell you, D Dean has designed and built some world masterpieces in our city. He's such a talented architect. Larry is the uh, most nationally prominent um, art photographer living in the state of Kansas. He's a distinguished professor of photography from WSU, just recently retired. For 25 years, he was a professor in the art department at Aporia State University. He, there are two books that focus on uh, Larry and his art photography. He's exhibited at such places as the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., the Art Institute of Chicago, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Milwaukee Museum of Art, and of course, every art museum <laughs> and, and elsewhere in the state of Kansas um, and this uh, region. The Wichita Art Museum presented his Kansas Farmers exhibition in 2018. I see some, nod some nodding heads, uh, people who remember that show with fondness. So um, they are here to share their expertise um, and their love of art to code today. So um, please, uh, the two of you, take the stage. Okay, so I'm Larry, part of the Dean and Larry exit <laughs> duo. <laughs> um, we worked as a team. Uh, I was the photographer, and Dean was, is, was the architectural historian. Because of Dean's amazing knowledge of Wichita history and building materials and architecture, He's actually going to be doing most of the lecture. My work's already done, and you're going to you're going to see pictures of it. And also, I'd like just to just kind of clarify because it's come up a couple of times already in introductions that <clears throat> uh, art photographer. I don't really call this art. This is documentary photography for me. But it was a really wonderful experience. Um, I would say that probably half of the buildings that are <clears throat> we photographed, I didn't have any idea they existed. I mean, just there were parts of Wichita that I hadn't visited or whatever. But um, you can just kind of, since Dean's going to be most of the talking, I'd like you to just think of me as kind of arm candy, and <laughs> <laughs> I can be the Vanna White. And you... uh, before we start, too, I would like to make a couple of special thank yous. Jim Hellman, I don't know if Jim's in the room tonight. Okay, Jim's there. Um, he provided us with a list of Art Deco buildings uh, that was just immensely helpful. It saved us, I can't begin to think how many hours of research to look, ferreting out these places. He had already had a list of them. Uh, also, thanks to those of you who allowed us access to your buildings. Special thanks goes to Bob Nugent, who got 
us permission to tour the federal courthouse, which I had tried to go into, and I got into the front door, and I said, no, <laughs> <laughs> you cannot go any further. <clears throat> and then I mentioned to Bob after we had toured it that I'd actually thought about getting a drone and <laughs> photographing. He said, outside a federal courthouse, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, in the process of taking the photos, more than, you know, I just would we'd drive around and I'd drive around and I'd find something and I'd be photo taking photographs and um, more than once people would come out and say, what are you doing? And, um, or was, can I help you? That was actually the polite way of saying it. <laughs> and the impolite thing, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> um, but I would explain, you know, what we're doing. We're involved with this project with the art museum, blah, blah, blah. And those were general, almost, they were met with um, invitations to come in, let me show you around, or occasionally it was whatever. <laughs> and, but not once did anybody say, get out of here. It was, people were, were open to the idea, and I, I really appreciate that. Okay, so um, before we get started, I just thought, well, uh, first of all, I'd like to <coughs> start by saying that Patricia stole my entire introduction. <laughs> I think we should compare notes before we come. Um, but I thought I would um, just kind of define what Art Deco is, because I think everybody knows what, what Victorian is. You know, it was, you know, here, I've, I've, I don't need to read my PowerPoint to you, but it was kind of suffocating to me. I remember at one time back in the 70s, I used to think that Victorian was, was beautiful, but not so much anymore. Where people sometimes get confused is Art Nouveau and Art Deco. And I think it's because, well, two of them, uh, two reasons. One, Art Deco, Art Nouveau, they sound a little bit alike. But uh, also that was the transition time. But Art Nouveau, the middle one here, grew out of the Victorian era. So it's kept some of that overly romantic, sentimental feeling about it. But what it really started concentrating on were the, the very organic flowing lines and if you look at the middle illustration there, I'm pretty sure that's a, a Alphonse Mucha <coughs> print. And you'll be hard pressed to find any straight lines in there. Everything is very vine-like and, and it, they took a lot of our inspiration from nature. Art Deco kind of was a rejection of all that. And let's, let's like, this is too much, let's simplify things. And this, I'm oversimplifying this. But um, there's a magazine cover right there, which I would point out to you. And you probably can't quite read it up there, but up on the top left-hand side, there's a list of the architects that are featured. And one of the architects that's featured in there designed the original Wichita Art Museum, and the article in that magazine is about the building of this building. Um, so, uh, Patricia was saying that the um, Art Deco started getting its roots in the early part of the 20th century, and I <coughs> found one place that dated it 1914. As any art movement, there's never a date that it starts and there's never a date that it ends. In fact, she also pointed out that the Art Deco is still around today. Um, but Art Deco as we know it started with this exhibition, which was in 1925, you can read that. And where the name came from eventually was also from this exhibition. Right down there, and this the French part of, uh, title for it there, Arts Deco, Decoratifs. So they took those two words, that became Art Deco. This exhibition was viewed by, um, what's my notes say here? It says 16 million visitors over the course of a seven month run. And one of the interesting things about the exhibition, besides the fact that this was a whole new way of designing things and thinking about things, was that it, it, it covered of not just paintings or not just sculptures or architecture, it fashions, appliances, everything started shifting. And 
the world was was ready to to start off on a new new footing. Art Deco, in part, was a re <clears throat> reaction to the over exuberance of Art Nouveau, replacing organic lines and shapes with geometric forms and bold colors. Think about painting Fauvis paintings. You know those really kind of bright, outrageous colors, and think about P Picasso and Brock's Cubist paintings, uh, the, the Damsel de Avion, um, that the, the very famous Picasso painting was done in 1907. And if you look and think about it, it's pretty deco. It's, it's all about geometric shapes and lines. So, that, so that's where the, the roots started somewhere in the very beginning of the 20th century. As is often the case, deco fell out of style, and much of it was lost, but happily, much of it remains. Our presentation is going to attempt to show you some of the Art Deco architecture that's left, and a few that are gone in Wichita, Kansas. And speaking of ones that were gone, I'm going to turn it over to Dean at this point. Well, so happy to be here and to see all the crowd. It's, it's real reassuring that our interest extends to the built environment also. Um, I, I would uh, like to get my notes out in front of me. And I want to make sure I don't forget to thank some of our contributors. Um, uh, of course, Patricia for twisting our arms, and uh, Matt Buckingham for that first initial um, email from him showing us Jim Hem Hellman's uh, work on, on his collection of uh, Wichita Art Deco products. Uh, Jamie Tracy and Eric Kale at the Wichita Historical Museum, they provided some great uh, lost uh, deco uh, documentation and of course Larry's excellent work it was fun to do some road trips in town with Larry but yes we thought since we're in the building I love the fact that part of the core is still with us when you go into the center portion of our galleries the uh, smaller spaces that are more geometric that's what was behind the facade of this uh, this, whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, the the United the the art museum, and it was to be like uh, it was to be a block in the middle that you can see over here on the left, with wings off to each side. And of course, this was designed, and it's part of the uh, Wichita problem, I'd say. There was a sort of a slow build for. Art Deco, because in the 20s, we weren't really doing heavy, uh, pure Art Deco work, but we were st still building things like the Broadview Hotel, the uh, uh, Orpheum Theater were both of that period in the 20s, early 20s, and so they just hadn't uh, latched on to the Deco as much <laughs> as they would, uh, especially in the late 20s, and so the Art Museum was designed in, in 29 by Clarence Stein, and um, these came out of some documentation at Cornell where he left his papers. Uh, but the main thing to notice is that the stairs outside over um, here, he's actually been photographed on, on his work, and these grand stairs that uh, came out from the core uh, did get uh, accomplished, whereas the core didn't even, uh, the, the top uh, third floor was left off, the additions off to the side were gone, and so it really, um, you know, really was sort of a uh, problem of, of designing something in 29 and then the crash of 29 and then you got to deal with it. And so uh, finally, um, in, in uh, a few years, uh, they did, were able to in 35 get the project built. Anyway, you do see some of the panels that were up close. Uh, these uh, uh, 
relief ball relief panels were done on either side of the entryway. And I do have a long history with the Art Museum. I remember in fourth grade, I think we had a field trip from Hillside Elementary School where we came to the steps. I remember gathering out in the bright sunshine and we got to walk in. And of course, it's a dark gallery. It was just an impressive, uh, we, we sat at the base of um, John Stuart Curry's Indian, uh, the corn oil. And I just remember those sayings from, from a trip. And that uh, field trip also included the Art Association, which was on um, 3rd and Belmont in a residence. So anyway, uh, the process of, of getting a project built was, was you know, part of the problem in Wichita in the 30s. But one of the successful stories, of course, is North High School. Beautiful building. It was um, described as a history of Kansas written in steel and stone. American Art Deco with Native American and pioneer themes, by the way, done in a very respectful way, I think. And uh, I think Glenn Thomas, who was the architect, uh, called it Prairie American style. But he um, came to Wichita after meeting another uh, architect that also re relocated to Wichita in the uh, uh, 15, 19, 20, 1915 period, and uh, Glenn and he had met in the, at the University of Chicago. And so when they came to Wichita, they worked together for a while, but then Glenn Thomas set off on his own, and uh, this was uh, one of many projects, but again, he would, uh, and I, you know, some people might say it's it's not so purely deco, but it's got the geometry and the towers. You know, you have a, a couple towers flanking the main tower. Uh, that was a common vertical uh, emphasis. And all the banding at the top that was then repeated. And, and to give uh, credit, the new structures that surround the building have repeated those details. And so things blend very well. The uh, other part of the team was Bruce Moore, who was a sculptor that uh, came to Wichita when he was 12 years of age, went to school here, then got uh, interested in art and was supported uh, greatly by artists here in town, uh, supporters of the arts in here in town. And so he got an uh, education and uh, was back home in, uh, uh, in this 1929 period, and he was recruited to do the artwork, the sculpture work, the uh, buffalo heads, the Indians, uh, just he was, uh, I think he worked on the panels also. So he uh, has a real uh, strong influence on this period of our deco history. And uh, staying up in that part of the, of the city is than the bridge that you see to the west of the school. And it, uh, of course, also uses the Indian and, and Buffalo motif, but it also plays up the columns, the vertical, the marching of the, of the uh, uh, light poles down the, down the bridge. I mean, it's just, again, reminiscent of, of uh, the verticality and the geometry of, of the, the whole movement. Here's a sort of a close-up of the, of the detail that's on the school. But the unique thing about this project, this was out of cartholite material, not um, uh, terracotta, which is uh, what the product there at the North High is, the school itself. This was a locally developed product that uh, you'd make a mold and cast these objects in the mold and then add color and uh, uh, texture sometimes. It was, the texture often was uh, crushed glass. And uh, the durability has been really great. Uh, you can see the buffalo panel here. Uh, maybe a little discoloration, but um, this product has been holding up really wonderfully. Uh, sometimes the terracotta gets moisture behind it and it pops the glazed part of the terracotta, terracotta off. And so there's some maintenance problems. But you know, this was another great uh, Bruce Moore and Glenn Thomas collaboration. Um, 
Then further west, when you cross the river and you go uh, four or five blocks, you turn north on Payne, and you find the John Marshall Junior High or Intermediate School. And this, again, uh, I'm not in sequence so much right now, but it was, it was the um, 1939, uh, so it's 10 years after North High, and it was without Bruce Moore's involvement. But it really shows the, oh, the amount of the uh, deco graphics, which um, just be aware, of, look at your calendar, that Jim Hellman will be giving a presentation on uh, Art Deco and graphics, and uh, that will be something you shouldn't miss. But these panels and these towers are reminiscent of what we see at, at North High, and uh, fixtures, light fixtures that, that um, kids may or may not appreciate, but uh, I sure love seeing those things remain. Uh, the uh, panels were all, uh, from what I can tell, they were, um, I'll show you a close-ups of some of the panels that Larry put together for us. But they were done, I have a, um, over here on my show and tell table over to the, to the side, there's a, a, a Xerox copy of an original sketch from the office of uh, Glenn Thomas. And so they were laid out by the architects and then taken by a, a, a terracotta company and made into these products. And uh, of course, great, Great work there. Um, getting back into the the um, development of Deco in Wichita, I'm I'm showing you a series of what are just schools because I think it tells the story of how it started with with uh, uh, more geometric Deco work and transitioned it into uh, Streamline, which has not been mentioned a lot, but, you know, uh, Art Modern, Streamline architecture, uh, it sort of uh, it was the tail end of this time period. But this is down off of uh, Seneca to the west when you hit the Alley, Alley Park, I believe. And it's showing, um, let me get my pointer out here, uh, this, uh, they say, is cartholite, but I know that the product up along the roof line, and you see it up above in other spots, it is definitely the cartholite, and it, it seems like it's pristine and in, in, in it, how it's holding up. This appears to have some painted uh, enhancements. It's a little uh, garish, but, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it, I'm glad they've retained it. Unfortunately, that it used to be the main entrance with a, a nice set of doors. Um, and these schools typically were added on to um, multiple times, as you can imagine. So that was typical of the period. Another school that followed in um, 1930 was the Longfellow Elementary School. It's down on South Main. And it is, uh, you know, just the amount of, Again, the graphics that show up. Uh, this I have not confirmed as cartholite, but it's held up well. And um, the brick, unfortunately, you know, there's maintenance that, that, that happens at buildings, and you can really see the, the original brick was pretty um, uh, soft and compatible, but when they, maybe they lost some, uh, up in the parapet area, you get weathering on both sides of the walls, you got some problems, and so new brick wasn't going to quite match, and so you get the, more of a speckled affair, but this was, and then the, this panel that I'm floating over now was uh, a little later addition, but it's still with the f geometry, the, the freeze line above the openings. And, uh, but the colorful nature of this uh, has not been painted, as far as I'm aware. Uh, this recently went to private hands, so it hopefully will be developed into a, uh, I think residential was mentioned. Then uh, this is the work that gets into, um, oh, uh, the middle portion is Robinson Junior High, which uh, was done in 31. Again, Ed Forsbloom was the architect. He was also doing uh, the, uh, he did in, you know, 10 years earlier, the Broadview Hotel. But it's 
got some great uh, deco motifs, and uh, I've heard inside the uh, auditorium is really wonderful. Uh, the uh, Lincoln School is down at Lincoln and Topeka, and it has that beginning of the streamline effect, and this was 1935. And uh, you can see the glass block going around the corner, but you get a, a big emphasis on the overhead and the uh, uh, horizontal lines, but always sort of a portal type entry that grabs your attention with flanking uh, benches on either side. It, it was a common motif. Franklin Elementary, which is more uh, uh, Delano, uh, south side of Douglas at Elizabeth, it also had this uh, streamlining effect, the graphics that were strap metal uh, signs and uh, smooth stone coupled with textured brick. And it, uh, it was uh, uh, 38, or, I'm sorry, uh, 41. So we're getting a little past our timeline, but it, uh, I do think that architecture sort of has a lag that, you know, the, uh, uh, you can buy stuff at the store that's deco and they try to be trendy especially. The architecture is a little slower process. And, uh, and so this uh, still got the horizontal uh, flowing lines that I think is indicative of a lot of our art deco. Then the Kellogg School that you see from, most prominently see from Kellogg Highway itself, <laughs> It's also got the curved um, portals that are two stories now with an entry and the same uh, flanking benches on either side of the entry and, and some detail at the top. So it's, it's right on target in the uh, in 1940s. Um, and many of these projects were done by an Overend, it's called Overend and Boucher uh, Architects, and they did a, a, a ton of work that uh, shows up and uh, they were big proponents of, of the streamline projects especially. So uh, we can go now and Larry you you're supposed to speak up if you if I'm missing something of course but the we um, yeah. would go somewhere and he would say <laughs> well that brick was manufactured in Humboldt Kansas between 1910 <laughs> and 1911. See I'm sparing you all that stuff. <laughs> but, so. the, but the mortar you know the aggregate there that's probably from so-and-so quarry. <laughs> well uh, not quite like that. <laughs> you're you, you are eye candy and ear candy too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> but what we're getting into now is I'm going to watch my time. Uh, Allen's Market, you might know it as Marquee Motors. It's down in the area of Hillside and Douglas. And of course, this was again sort of the 30s time period where I think the, especially the grocery stores were getting tired of being flooded out downtown, and so they sought the higher ground. And so there was two markets up there that uh, were both of deco styling, but the Marquee Motors and the Allen's Market was really a great example of the uh, use of cartholite. Again, this is that product that was made here in town. Uh, Lusco Brick and Stone was sort of before, before Lusco really was named. It was um, Lumberman Supply, I believe. And uh, they uh, also with um, oh, uh, Brick and Stone Company, anyway, they're the ones credited with developing the cartholite. But you can tell it's in such great shape and the colors are, you know, bright and vibrant, you know, at these columns, capitals, the ridge across the top, the top coping. Anyway, it's just a, a great uh, example of, of retail-oriented Art Deco. And then when we go across the street, you get to Margaritas. Now this has been <laughs> painted up a little bit, mm -hmm. but it's, it is, uh, and it's got the date right there, 1931. It also is a, a great example of how, uh, you know, they wanted to be more contemporary, and, and I think it's right at the same time, yeah, 31. So, uh, you know, some of these projects I feel were started before the crash and they were able to complete them. And then it seems like we get a little quiet after that in construction. Yeah, this is essentially right across the street for the Marquee Motors building. 
Yes, right, just right uh, across the street, and then just a little further up. So the, was this oh, also a grocery store? Yes, those were both grocery stores, and they, uh, the history is that they did abandon. Carl Bell's was still downtown, or at, at 13th and Broadway area, or Mar, uh, Topeka, and uh, they stayed in that area, but these others sort of gave up on the constant worrying about floods, so that's why they came up came up the hill a little bit. Dockham Drugstore was actually a little before, and it was 27. And I we included this just because, again, it's got the horizontal deco motif, the, even the, you know, having the little detail at the top of the walls. But, you know, some of this gets into, which is common, where you sort of mix the styles. And uh, But this is another example of this Cartholite product. And when you're up close, this material is more smooth um, and not so roughly textured. So it was another version, an earlier version of cartholite. Again, it's held up very well. Now when we get uh, a little more into the, um, uh, still in the 30s, there's just a lot of construction right in the 30s. Uh, this also part of town, this East Douglas, was automobile sales area. Uh, this one recently uh, renovated and used by their offices for uh, GLMV uh, architects. That was the um, Arch, J. Arch Butts building, Packard. They sold Packards out of this building and then they changed with the times as uh, different, uh, different styling came in. But uh, it's got a great uh, portal also that's stair stepping. Uh, material that goes back to the entry that uh, was restored in, in this renovation. The um, eagle motif, again, this is um, is probably terracotta. And Here's a really good example of what you're talking about, the terracotta flaking off. Yes, on unfortunately. Maybe at the bottom where it uh, holds more moisture and the freeze comes and it pops. We've got some problems with that, that over the years we're going to have to watch. Um, this, automo this is another automobile sales building. It uh, first was leased to Studebaker. So uh, again, it was um, 1930. Uh, it, later years it turned into um, Western Auto. But again, uh, more of a brick, and this could very well just be cast stone. And I should mention, cast stone is like, uh, it's not carved stone or limestone, but it's man-made, uh, but it's just concrete without the heavy um, aggregate. And so it, it uh, uh, turns into what looks like limestone, basically. But they can uh, put texture in it as they're casting it. But the round circle motif, again, is sort of a hallmark. And let's see the these I think were all this Schmidt, uh, Boucher, and Overend architects, and so they had a real big um, compilation of work during this period, and they were somewhat of a spinoff. Uh, again, uh, Lorenz Schmidt was. Uh, he and, and uh, Glenn Thomas were classmates at the University of, of uh, Illinois in Chicago. And uh, so they both had different practices, but they uh, did continue with uh, uh, Art Deco and a lot of their projects, although they did also create other styles. Um, another example of that is the tall um, Hillcrest Apartments. You know, that was of this period but it went with a strictly um, Tudor revival style. Uh, this is the, we call it the Ellis Singleton Building. Um, it was actually later sort of nicknamed the Petroleum Building. And you probably know where it is on South Broadway. Uh, but great uh, interior motifs of the elevator call signal area in, in a triangle. Uh, these are patterns up at the ceiling, uh, sort of an arch ceiling that I'll show you on another slide. But it also contained a garage in the back that was novel to have a way to drive in and park. And uh, uh, partway up, there's some uh, little statue uh, features up here that uh, are eagles. And it's just a wonderful building, again, by uh, 
Boucher, Schmidt, Boucher, and Overend. Uh, 1929, so again, this was just squeaking in past the uh, depression, or past the crash of, of 29. Um, another interiors of that project, the elevator doors, and you know, this stuff was not specifically made for the project, but you know, you could go to your supplier of hardware and pick out the stair-stepping details on the hardware and, and uh, you know, sort of make your um, accessories match your building. And again, here's this slightly arched ceiling that with an interesting chandelier, but the elevators and those glass panels that Larry had a shot of were in these, um, at the bottom of each of the, of the arched uh, vaulted ceilings. And we've got the eagles that are on those um, columns uh, above the entry. And a little better close up of some of the color that, uh, and you know, again, generally in pretty good shape. Uh, we're thankful for that. Uh, then down the way, we get into a little smaller commercial work. This is the Johnson Colmia building. I think it was the Johnson Drugstore, technically, when it was built um, in 1930. Um, it housed a drugstore, a grocery store, a barber shop, and a wallpaper store. There was uh, a main entrance, uh, probably for the drugstore, because he was the owner of the building. And uh, he had, uh, 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 there was a, uh, the mason at the Brick and Stone Company that developed Carthonite, Cartholite, uh, helped him on this project. And, uh, um, and again, it's the Cartholite material that you see in all this decorations. There's a little bit of tile work down below, which interesting uh, detail is there's the reverse swastika back, you know, in the 30s meant friendship at that time. And uh, it was actually an American Indian uh, symbol. Uh, but this is a great example of, of individual offices, and um, I'm going to show you. Here is the side view facing north, and you see the, the again, cartholite that's held up real well. Usually they coupled it with just a sort of neutral brick, and uh, here are these panels. There's a gap right here because there was a door there once, and when you jump over here to this insert that Larry put together for us, this is from Jim Hellman's photography from years before which he shared with us, uh, again, deserves thanks for that. But here's the, the windows and doors, I should say the doors, that uh, were either removed or replaced, where you really do see the characteristic stair-stepping, it may be hard to read, but you get the same stair-stepping that you see up on the uh, top of the windows, where, uh, you know, that continuation of detail and theme that you get, uh, which was, a, Another interesting thing about Deco is I've heard that it's, it wasn't a revival style. It was sort of your own style, and you, didn't, uh, you weren't trying to be like a colonial or a Spanish revival. It was just uh, so exuberant, as Patricia calls it, uh, you know, that it had its own uh, beginning and uh, really doesn't try to mimic anything. But again, at the top, over the doors, uh, some of the cartholite panels and uh, detail. It's just a really nice example. Um, now we come to uh, the Jewish synagogue at uh, south of Douglas uh, on Kansas Street. And uh, I did research on that one to know that again, it's 1930, Ed Forsbloom, who did again um, uh, the uh, uh, Broadview Hotel, uh, he came and, and uh, did out of Cartholite again uh, these entry points and, uh, uh, and, and not often the lintels and the sills of windows and perhaps this work along here was Cartholite just done in a very neutral way without the color. Here, right, I'm sorry. This is showing the cartholite in the little detail, intricate detail on either side of the, the pillars at the front door. 
it was just a way, a great way to, and again, it's holding up really nice. Uh, the, um, and that's the, currently the Metropolitan Table of Hope Church, uh, which has done a good job of keeping it intact. Uh, the Community Theater of Wichita uh, set up uh, in the Temple Emmanuel, which is uh, 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 just a few years later. I think it had a typical problem. It, it I think, was designed in 27. Uh, they were raising money for it. And uh, it wasn't until 32 that it uh, got some uh, enough funding where they could build it. And uh, above the door, um, in Hebrew and in English, is love thy neighbor as thyself. And again, the stair-stepping detail. Uh, there's uh, tile work in this architrave around the front doors probably original front doors with a little bit of stair-step detail, and then, again, the hardware that you pick to go with the theme. I uh, read that they located this far north on the lot there, if you know it's on the south side of 2nd Street, and um, they wanted to preserve a m more land to the south to build a, uh, a bigger auditorium. This was meant to be more of a fellowship hall, but it served as their uh, temple for many, many years. This uh, has been sort of a sleeper for many years, even for me. It's the KG&E building there at uh, the Canal Route and Central. It's on the east side. And it's got the, again, heavy portal that's decorated and the round clock being practical. And uh, across the top, underneath in the shadow of the uh, electrical uh, solar panels is the Kansas Gas and Electric all spelled out in, in graphics. Um, it's got a little bit of uh, sort of winged Egyptian uh, around on the sides where you can still see it. But they actually, uh, when Larry and I first went out, th this was covered up with about three cedar trees that you could hardly see that. And uh, just a uh, uh, good fate was it that they decided to clean it up, and it really shows well now from even when you're going north on, on the canal route. You we didn't it. ask them to do that. No, we didn't. <laughs> and they didn't bug us either. <laughs> they, they weren't out there wondering what we were doing. But I appreciate when somebody is taking care of their projects like that. Um, down the, in the heavier commercial stuff, this uh, is 1931. So we're progressing a little bit. This is actually an architect from St. Louis, but it was the home of... Stephen Derry, and it was really uh, up in the in the graphics. It's Stephen's uh, Ice Cream and Ice Company, and about this time when they got the building built, they decided to go into pasteurizing, and it was the only place in Wichita that pasteurized milk, and so they they had that market. You know, they actually uh, expanded into Arc City, uh, Hutchinson, Oklahoma City, and Amarillo, so it was quite a local. Uh, uh, success story and it uh, of course these are one of the Jamie Tracy's uh, contribution from the historical museum but all the milk trucks lined up in front of the building and the windows are open for f for ventilation and uh, again terracotta the, and you know it's all still got its shine on it and uh, medallions I thought maybe these were added at some time for lighting or something but uh, those came out of the are shown on the original uh, photographs that I found. Then you get to um, someone that didn't have so much of a budget constraint, uh, although I think they had to pare some things down. The courthouse was a 1931 project. Uh, again, it was national architect under the watch of, uh, of the architect of the treasury. Um, and it's just a, especially on the outside, uh, the inside is wonderful too, but you know, these <laughs> towers that flank the tower, uh, then smaller towers, uh, verticals that uh, are between the windows, sort of portals on the corners. Of course, I know this is the, the post office. Uh, when you look at the panels that are between the windows, you know, they're, they're uh, bronze, uh, cast and wonderful detail and uh, again American Indian and corn and wheat 
it's just a fantastic project. The um, inside, you go in, and here's an example of, of you know, they, they go a little classic on the inside with lots of coffered ceilings and uh, details, but when you get to like a column between, uh, I think they might have been between postal windows, uh, you know, it's, a, again, nature with more geometry applied to it, uh, you know, flowers or maybe a small peacock and tulip type leaves. It was uh, uh, interesting to see that and the quality of the material is wonderful there. Although you can see where the, the windows were for the uh, ticket counter for your postal needs, there's divots there where people stepped, uh, you know, for 30 years and ground the, the uh, uh, marble down just a little bit and there's a long one at the south uh, toward the east and we wondered why that long divot was ground into the marble. Of course now it's all polished nicely and Eric came up with the fact that that was a, the candy counter that was run by a blind, a blind black man that was there for I think 20 or 30 years and he ran that sh ran that store and uh, was just a you know a fixture that that was part of the place uh, but I, I like that sort of ghosting of of times past that you see but inside again you get some really interesting uh, details or actually this is outside uh, this freeze that goes along but inside there's some great eagles at the uh, Vestibules when you come in, uh, they're top, uh, bronze top to, to the vestibules. Uh, again, it gets a little more um, classical when you're inside, this egg and dart perimeter and the uh, Greek key, but it's, uh, then you get to a, a, down at the bottom of the stairs where the elevators occur at each end, you get this Indian carved, I'm sure it was hand carved into a block of, um, Limestone. Yeah, that, they were they were carved because there's two of them and they're and they're they're slightly different that's from right. each other. Yeah. The uh, back to the exterior again. You know, you get the um, things that uh, may have uh, been available in a mass market, but you could change the uh, motif. And so here's a buffalo face, and uh, you get over here, you get the wheat and the corn. This is at the flagpole, so it's a really uh, neat example of, uh, well, things that were built to last, and, and uh, it's doing a good job of that. During the um, 30, middle 30s, really projects weren't going so well a, on a commercial level, but uh, if you could get the WPA or Public Works Administration uh, money could be gotten to promote construction, hiring architects, uh, hiring laborers, and uh, this was the comfort station they call it there at uh, uh, by Park Villa at North Riverside Park, and it's got cartholite uh, across. It's a real subtle cartholite usage above uh, some of the windows, and uh, but then at the end, and of course. This was L.W. Clapp, which was um, director, superintendent of parks, and he got involved in this building. And uh, it's got clear story windows that shine daylight into the, each restroom, and they're really uh, little vestibules that are outdoor, um, so you're not opening the door uh, and seeing right into the restroom. But uh, on the sides, both sides, then you get the... Uh, this effect that, again, was geometry, uh, sort of a uh, sun rays coming down. And here's the example of the crushed glass that was part of the uh, cartholite. And this would have been a product that would have been cast in a long, and maybe there's some joints, but it was uh, independent. And then the bricklayer would lay it in with the brick. And so it was sort of a... Uh, a nice way to introduce color and the durability of it. It stands proud of all the brick faces and th this one is a little more of a, the red color. So it's a great example of that crushed glass being used. If you want to search this out, <clears throat> this is a really good example too of what happens to brick because I don't think you can see it 
on the slide, but I'm going to say there's probably a dozen faces off of the off of the blonde brick that have just broken off right, over the, through right the winter. Up there in the parapet, it's yeah, popped. Yeah, the whole just, brick face. It's like a yeah. quarter of an inch thick, and it's yeah, a whole brick. Yeah, uh, and. And you know, again, that sometimes the roof may have been leaking, or you know, this actually is part of that uh, outdoor vestibule, so it gets weather from both sides. You know, we've got these problems that we have to deal with, and uh, sometimes they don't work as well. But even the regular brick products have problems. Part of this whole series then is uh, leading up to another WPA project, and that's the Wichita Airport, which is a great example again of of. Uh, Glenn Thomas and his office uh, struggling with, uh, I think, a five-year delay on the getting it built. It was designed uh, uh, in 29, but didn't get built until 34. Again, thanks to the uh, Public Works Administration. Uh, L.W. Clapp, again, he was active, and he designed this mural of uh, Lindbergh flying over the Pacific, or Atlantic. And, um, but the example of the stair stepping that correlates with the steel windows, you know, that have the same pattern, and, and then these big uh, eagles that are spread out uh, between the lower and upper windows. Anyway, it's a, another great example, the tower flanking the entry and flanked by other <laughs> vertical towers. Um, motif of uh, the, in the cartholite of the airplane, which shows up in the ironwork inside and out of, of the, of the uh, project. I'm glad we have that in our bailiwick. And just a few residential projects I wanted to show. These were two buildings on North uh, Topeka. One was built for a client by Henry on construction. And the next one, just a month or two later, started building, and it was for Henry on himself for his investment, and he chose cartholite again. Uh, the panels are cartholite as well as the decorative items, but it, again, it shows, uh, you know, you could go with a sort of a straight conservative uh, commercial brick look on your apartment, or you could uh, jazz it up, a little, literally jazz it up. Uh, down the street over, this is the interior of the Commodore Hotel. And again, it's, it's sort of in the Spanish revival, but, you know, instead of having just a little bit of trim, I mean, they go up with a stair-stepping top and a stair-stepping, this is on the inside. The chandelier is wonderful, deco, masterpiece. And they're going, the new owners are uh, restoring the rooms upstairs. We went up to an eighth floor uh, uh, studio and even the light fixtures they're they're keeping and and uh, enhancing them with LED light bulbs that look sort of like early Edison light bulbs because they they were exposed uh, early light fixtures they tended to like to expose the light bulb this see. was a surprise for both of us because we were just <coughs> driving by I said have you ever been inside that building I don't know anybody had ever been inside that building and, <laughs> and Dean said he hadn't yeah. and I hadn't and so so we went, we, the doors are locked, and some guy was outside and said, well, you have to have a code to get in, and you have to call <laughs> so-and-so to get a code, and, and then somebody walked out, so we just grabbed the door and walked in. <laughs> and I've been taking photographs, and this guy comes out from behind the counter, can I help you? And, and next thing you know, we're riding the elevator up to the eighth floor, and he's opening up the closets and showing us. It, it had the Murphy bed that dropped, you had a pair of French doors that opened and then the Murphy bed dropped down. It was there, but they're keeping that stuff. So I'm real pleased with, with that. And, uh, and the attitude. size of the apartment we went to is about the size of a, a good sized closet. Yeah. The yeah. Whole part, the whole apartment. The whole apartment. A little tiny bathroom, <laughs> a little tiny kitchen. It's amazing, but they're, I appreciate what they're doing. The uh, streamlined look shows up in this Roussel Apartments. And uh, again, I don't know a whole lot about it, but the glass block curves and the banding and a little bit of extra detail in the brickwork actually at the top. Uh, there's a, this was a 1923 building that was uh, listed in, uh, on the landmark as, as a deco. And it's sort of, it's got the angularity. It's not the curvy uh, portals that you normally see, but it's, it's a nice example. It's right on uh, 13th, so it's, uh, a little tricky there. This was uh, Gerald Griffin, 
He's uh, an architect that practiced in, the, in this time period. Uh, this was his studio, again, in 1940, so it's getting toward the end of our uh, uh, timeline of the exhibit, at least. But the, the penthouse was added later in the 50s. So this is uh, South Market, and it's, uh, you, you've got, uh, again, the scalloped, uh, wavy effect at the top, but Cartholite Street uh, and, and panels uh, that show the street number and these uh, purple glass and green glass. It, it's quite a, quite a project. Uh, another set of streamlined projects from the 30s was the Ablaw duplex, where there's two families, uh, the Ablaw families, and the mother, I think, lived in the center portion. And uh, it's got the streamlined look with metal workings. They had started, which we'll get to real soon, is the uh, uh, Valentine building uh, construction of the little diners that were all across the country. And uh, the apartment building uh, for this slide is there on East Douglas on the north side of the street near uh, Happiness Plaza or whatever it's called now. Uh, so it was built as an apartment and all the other uh, houses along it are still pretty much original, uh, typical residential projects. But with the Ablaws starting in, and they had a hotel uh, supply store, and so they were doing these Valentine buildings uh, in the 20s, and they had an employee, uh, Valentine was his name, and he, um, they wanted to get out of the business in the late 20s, uh, uh, or probably, maybe I'm wrong on that, the late 30s, they wanted to get out of the business, and so Valentine took it over and created his own manufacturing company, uh, this one is still existing uh, on West Douglas, 1609 West Douglas, and it's uh, uh, in a used car lot that's empty now, but it's at the very back, and so it's a great example. There's a few around. There's the newer ones that are from the 50s, like Dine Quick on North Broadway, but uh, to stay with the deco, you know, streamline and the emphasis over the front door, I mean, it was just like a small version of some of the big buildings we've been seeing. You might talk about the graveyard there, too. Yes, the, this is the graveyard, the rusty one. There's five or six of the Valentine buildings there uh, in that spot. It's a uh, near ex uh, exploration place, in fact, on the other side of, of McLean. And uh, uh, we'd love to see something happen with them. Unfortunately, one of our best ones, where I ate breakfast occasionally, was the Flow In Cafe, and it was on... Uh, Central, south side of Central, right next to Fortney uh, Tile Company, which I dealt with on architectural projects. This was his mother, was Flo, and she ran this for years, as, and I think they lived, or she lived in the house behind. Well, it was gone one day, and I asked uh, uh, Mr. Fortney, what happened? Well, some, actually it's the Auto, Antique Automobile Association in Hershey, Pennsylvania, bought it and moved it, and it's just like the um, Buckminster Fuller Dymaxion house. You know, it was produced here and it was used here, but uh, it's gone to a, maybe a better home. It's, 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 it, it is indoor uh, display now, and it's been restored. So it's in good shape, just like the Dymaxion house is, uh, but you have to go to Hershey, Pennsylvania to see it. Uh, then uh, toward the... Again, this was a, um, a streamline, and it, it happened to be a, what's called the Batch Elder Brothers Conoco Station up at 18th and Broadway. And it's real distinctive, and the pumps were out in front. Um, it was 1937, so we're getting, again, toward the end of, end of that period of the streamline, the horizontals, and the glass block. And this was an interesting situation where I knew there was a great lobby with, uh, for instance, the deco uh, light fixtures, not chandeliers, and then just the very simple um, detail of cove molding. Instead of decorative cove molding, it was just stair-stepping down to create some interest in the ceiling. It was a major remodel in 19... Um, it was remodeled, I think, in 1920, 
So it was at the, but it was at the time, it, the building had been built by the Coronado Club, which was like an early Wichita promotion club. And then uh, they changed their name to the Wichita, Cl Wichita Club, and they ran out, ran out of this building, and I think some of the members had offices in the building, but, but uh, this was a remodel of the 19, it was a 1909 building to begin with, really, really nice brick building on, uh, uh, you know, you're not seeing the addresses on this, but this is uh, north side of First Street uh, between the, the uh, Orpheum and the Lux. So it's uh, a really nice brick where you can see over here, really interesting shadows and whatnot. A uh, little bit of terracotta, but the real joy on this one is inside. The handrails, the letter boxes in the same style like the uh, courthouse, uh, the, the great light fixtures, and a new owner, a female um, Hispanic uh, owner who runs real estate and insurance, so she needed a new spot for her insurance company, so she uh, has t taken the plunge to get in and and uh, fix it up, and, and uh, so I think it's in good That was hands. another case, can I help you? Yeah, and she was right right there I, when we I, needed I, her. I think we almost got adopted. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. And then she wants me to let her know if I find anything about the light fixtures, because they're little tiny... Uh, anemic light fixtures on there now, and she just knows there has to be some better light fixtures that were on, on originally the on the outside. And then when we get further down the road, uh, really sort of past our timeline, but this is the Ennis, the West addition to the Ennis building. And it's got the great graphics, which Jim Hellman pointed out to us way early in this project, the stair-stepping around the entries. And, of course, this is in good shape with the osteopathic hospital that's going in, or the uh, college. Uh, but the round discs up at the, up at the uh, top of the building, the stair-stepping down, it's just a great, great example of, of the sort of still heavy deco, a little bit of streamlining, but it... I'm glad we have it. From the Historical Museum, when I asked about deco projects, they came up with the, the Grayson store and the Lerner store. These were right next to each other and in the facade of a more turn of the century, almost Victorian brickwork building, a typical. And this was, I think, on the 200 block of East Douglas on the south side. Uh, and uh, they opened in 1933. And of course, retail, um, they were trying to sell stuff and uh, could be as uh, fashion conscious as possible. And uh, I think there was chrome used up in the lattice work up above, and the doors are great, you know. So it uh, these, of course, long gone. Decorative stuff around the the opening here. Uh, we just love love the fact that uh, we have images of this from the 30s. Um, then on West Douglas, and maybe somebody remembers this, I vaguely remember, but this was where the bank is now on the south side of Douglas, and it was the Civic Theater, and it had a lobby that went from Douglas all the way back to where the real thousand occupant theater was. It was at the back of the lot, and so there was spaces for commercial on either side, and so this was, became part of the street storefront along Douglas, but it had terracotta or a terrazzo in the sidewalk. You walked in and it's got the stair-step doors that lead you in, but all of this was neon work with uh, polished aluminum angles so that you, instead of just seeing one strand of neon, you saw four or five at a time and it multiplied, but it really was a great example of the, of the exuberance at this time, and I think I've got it, down 1936. Inside, there was, uh, you know, lots of uh, black and white marble used, and chromium was used in the description in 36 when they had the grand opening. Uh, and then, unfortunately, one of the last um, losses we had was the Alice Hotel. Um, it would have been, you know, a great uh, either transition to, to apartments, um, had a great lobby up a half, a short flight of stairs, 
And then, but they had the Kit Kat Cafe, uh, uh, coffee shop was on one of these spaces, a little bit of the vertical uh, detail and then seeing it up at the top also. It was built in um, 30, 1930, and uh, the neon sign was built with it uh, uh, the year after it opened. And they turned that off on New Year's Eve of uh, 1930, transitioning to 1931. Unfortunately, it was blown down by wind, and so we lost that early on. But the whole project is an unfortunate situation. Um, and my last slide today is the John Mack Bridge. Again, it's not uh, overtly uh, deco, but it's 1931. Again, a works progress uh, uh, administration project to keep people busy. And uh, it's, the geometry is such that it, it sort of reads as a uh, uh, sort of a goodbye to our little road trip that we've taken today. And uh, I do have uh, a few little uh, show and tells over on the side table of uh, some actual uh, work of the Art Museum in 1933 in, art, in order to get the Art Museum built. Apparently, uh, Glenn Thomas uh, became a um, local uh, representative or uh, someone the, uh, Stein could work with, and he drew up a plan of, of even further doctoring the smallest plans that Stein put together of eliminating some side wings and, and some details, and, and so I have uh, uh, in my collection over there. There's also a, uh, a delineation of a pool house in Iola that was done by that Griffin architect on Broadway with a neat, neat deco studio on Broadway and uh, some other uh, things you might be interested in. But uh, we might have some time for questions. Okay. So if uh, questions. Uh, I'm Kathy Campbell. This is my cousin Alice Pfizer and my sister Martha Smith, and we are direct descendants of Glenn H. Thomas. Amen. He was yep. our grandfather. Yes. And we are delighted that you're presenting his work like this. This is just phenomenal. Well, to us. you know, and I, my first job out of college was with Thomas Harris Action Mason, which were descendants of Glenn Thomas, his son. And, uh, and so I've always had an affinity for that work and, and again, a, an irony of just um, uh, lucky happenstance. I had a two-month stint in Washington, D.C. during my uh, junior year in college and uh, the landlady kept talking about this artist upstairs that's from Kansas. Well, it ended up being Bruce Moore and his wife. <laughs> And so I got to meet him mostly on the elevator, and uh, he, we tried to get together, but his health was failing. And uh, so between Glenn Thomas and working at the office and then having that experience in D.C., I uh, really had. Luckily, I could tell um, uh, Bruce Moore that I did a lot of study in the East High Library where his striding uh, panther was sitting there for years, and, and so I could tell him I honestly knew what his work was, including North High, of course. There was no question there, but I was not as astute about things in Wichita at that time as I should have been, but it was good to meet him. Thank you for mentioning that. Dean, how much uh, great uh, real estate did we lose during urban renewal? Well, you know, we did lose... Uh, uh, unfortunately, and you know, it wasn't always urban renewal, uh, like the, the Alice Hotel was just city commissioners feeling the pressure to do something and it was a pigeon roost and we heard uh, problems with structure and I talked to my structural engineer who did that study, said, oh, it was probably shrinkage cracks from the original construction. So, you know, they just uh, unfortunately felt they couldn't save the Eaton Hotel and the um, Alice together at the same time. Now, if they had just mothballed it for five or ten years and the growth of downtown apartments would have just been perfect for that. So it's those misunderstood. I was involved in Midtown of the what was called the Dunn Building at 13th and Broadway. It was a really nice uh, terracotta building by Glenn Thomas. 
and it had uh, colorations just like uh, North High, and so it was you work with the owner and uh, you know, try to show them the value of having all that covered space. Uh, there was enough space out and back for, he wanted a, a car wash for his filling station next door. And so it hit the dust. And so it's uh, missed opportunities. And, 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 uh, and now I've just to get a little speech about um, uh, embodied carbon. It's what the architects are talking about. Any building that's been built in the past has embodied carbon to create it and to maintain it, and it's there, and we should respect it, and uh, do whatever we can. If it's if it yeah if it's structurally unsound, you got to do something with that. But uh, the more we think about it, it's not just cultural history or architectural history. It's it's just plain old uh, environmental uh, environmental issues that we should be also thinking about when we tear down things. Urban renewal, you know, it brought some new life into things and now uh, my office in the Garvey Center, which is part of that project. And uh, of course, uh, uh, things do change and I, I understand that, but we did lose a lot with urban renewal. They were helpful on some of the Midtown. I was active at Midtown at the time and, you know, so uh, some of the problems with uh, expanding uh, health care projects eaten into the neighborhoods, uh, they got and helped control some of that. Urban renewal did, but yeah, in general it was a unfortunate. Urban removal, I think, was the name we used. I wanted to ask about the decorative qualities of um, our Wichita Art Deco. The reference to Native American design is so obvious here in many of the examples you've showed. Was that typical of Art Deco around the nation or was it more specific to our area and to, you know, to the prairies and the Southwest? I think it was definitely a local thing that, um, and of course, you know, we all, if you were active at that time in the profession, you saw the Frank Lloyd Wright House go up. That was a, what's called prairie school horizontal lines but done in a you know a different manner than than deco but just the fact that uh, uh, allegiance to some nature uh, whether it was uh, wheat corn and then the uh, respect of the American Indian especially seen at North High I think uh, I think it was a pretty good local phenomenon I'm sure you had influences in other places like uh, in New York, but New York just seemed uh, like the Chrysler building is mostly just geometry, and I don't know about any, <laughs> any real local influences to the style where it was freely done here in Wichita. And the Cartholite maybe helped that too because it was expressive in that way. So where was the Cartholite factory? factory? I haven't researched that. There is a good reference. Uh, if you get on uh, and just Google Cartholite, um, uh, uh, Barbara Hammond from the uh, Preservation Office put together uh, an article for uh, American Bungalow, and it's a real good resource for uh, all these projects that were mentioned. What do you think about the city's push uh, currently to tear down Sensory 2 and to tear down our old library, library. the public well, that, library. That, that is, of course, I'm on the uh, <laughs> side of let's find a good use for it and let's uh, respect the embodied carbon. You know, I know that's a dumb sounding word, but that's uh, resources that our taxpayers in the past have paid for and created and it's so flexible. That building you know, it can open up and uh, 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 the River Festival can move inside if the weather's bad for a concert. You know, it's just uh, really, I don't think we could pile into, uh, uh, say, the, the uh, uh, Performing Arts Center up in Kansas City. You, you wouldn't take your lawn chairs into that building where you can with the flexibility of what we have. Uh, so I definitely am for that uh, to be reused in some form or way. And uh, thanks for the question. Any more? It's been wonderful. Thank you for your attention.